first I want to talk about Amsterdam because Amsterdam is, I think, uh, indicative of cities in the world. And this is as much about cities as it is about water to me. Amsterdam seems to me, because this is all as a, an amateur, a lover of a city, Amsterdam seems to me to always be modern. It seems no matter when, it always sought to be modern. Um, so um, as it grew out of this marsh, you know, it was practical, but it, it, it really didn't just have this trade going on. It also had a myth of the spirit involved. It wasn't just trade that allowed it to grow. It was also, there was a religious miracle here still known and celebrated called the miracle of Amsterdam. Because as we look at the city in the future, we connect to the past more than ever before. In 1345, there's a story in the Kalverstraat, which was documented immediately and, and thoroughly, that a man dying was given the host. He threw it up. They shoveled it into the fire, and it did not burn. The next morning, the woman reached in, took it out. It did things. It was taken to the old church, where it resided for 200 years, 199 years. There's still a procession that goes through the city. This ritual effect of celebrating the city and looking more deeply into what this life is matters. Because why does it matter if somebody exists in Singapore or New Orleans or anywhere else? Unless there's some connection to something beyond. So this story, I think, in a way, it was a great boon to Amsterdam. Tour I mean, not tourists, pilgrims came and visited this city until a thief took this host out of the tabernacle and smelted that, but he threw the host into the water. So that, out of the old church, out of where St. Nicholas, you know, St. Nicholas is the, is the patron saint of Amsterdam, the patron saint of the water, before he was Santa Claus, is St. Nicholas. So there's a deeper root here, and there's something more ethereal. And so, you know, the story of this one is what the fire didn't take, the water did. So down in the water is the spirit. Now, that cultural root, I think, is a bit of our salvation. It's a question, and, and New Orleans is, is a, a question of survivability. But in this, or from this, you can also learn from what the English did. They found this helmet off the coast of Ipswich, and that helmet became the model for the Thames Barrier. That helmet, it was very, that cultural root's very important because you're asking the English people now to reinvest, right? This has to be changed. This isn't adequate for storm surge anymore. But because the English people have a connection of the heart to this, they can actually say, well, money will follow. So, you know, you in Amsterdam, we in Amsterdam, know this way of celebrating through the water, connecting to the water, in the water. In New Orleans, it's, it's really a, a return now. We're just learning to go back to the water, and that's, I'm going to show you mostly images of that. But the question I'm asking is, why does it matter? And where are we? Because we've, you know, the world's different now. It's a primal culture, and this is Marshall McLuhan who influenced me to become an architect. You know, it's all at once now. The most ancient and primitive things are here again. We're no longer, I mean, I'm up on the stage, but we're all participants in this culture now. It's not like somebody's on the outside and somebody's on the inside. It's all, you know, if you look at this place, it's all back to this ancient form where we're all together connected. So these kind of events where we talk about Singapore or Copenhagen or New Orleans, it's this connectedness of the global village that McLuhan saw and these forms of technology that are trumping all the traditional things. So that is the context, I think, that the city exists in. And as we start to look at that, then New Orleans being one of these cities and one of these points on Earth that really does connect and count. Uh, you know, the, the trade that moves through there is vast. Much, it's much like Rotterdam in that respect. You know, it's a, it's a water city, but it's a water city that's forgotten how to deal with that. So our work has been about making it again, giving it this identity, this connection to the depth of water, not just to the practicality of water. We have to be able to drink it. It's fundamental to life. But if you don't understand it as almost sacramental, then what? How do you get people to invest? Because, you know, we were not, 
we're not the place unaffected. This isn't theoretical to us, this flood. This is a pitiful flood defense system that failed and it flooded the city, but now they've built the hero version of that. And we are operating now with a, a perimeter system that should work, we hope, certainly way better than before. So what we've done, and Tracy referenced, you know, when you are way behind, you have to go to the people who know more and you study, but this in the village is a way to learn together. We connected to a great network of Dutch people if the levee you see there on the drawing is now sad, uh, you know, sound, and we have lots of work to do outside the levee because we have a much more active ecosystem than you have here, if we can rejuvenate that with the Mississippi River, most of our work, most of what you're gonna see is about urban water management, about what you do inside. We're not doing this from the same perspective as Copenhagen or Singapore with a lot of government support. We did this pretty much as citizen-driven and then some federal support to do this study. Our government assistance was from the Dutch. Uh, so we have this idea here of not just multiple lines of defense, which is a term that occurs, but living lines, things that can regenerate. What happened in New Orleans was uh, we got completely interested in technology. In 1920, this thing was invented, the most powerful pump in the world, and we went completely. Every drop of rain that falls, we didn't have to store, we had to pump. Right? So this addiction to pumping it out, building these sorts of structures, and we still are building that, okay? In 1920, they built that. In 1930, they built that. And in 2013, they're building that. So to shift this paradigm, it is, it's almost a prayer. So what do we got? The effects of that, you see the red line, you see the topography there, the section of the city, you see the effects of pumping in soft soils. These are peat soils, not all but you see the sinking of the city. And then the disregard for urban space is another critical aspect of what happened. And as we started the sketch, then you can easily see what you can do with these spaces, piecemeal, collectively, to add up to something more. What do we do? We saw this in this green-blue layer in Copenhagen, right? So where do we find this way to quit burying our treasure and start, putting, start working with the landscape? We have these problems, it still floods. New Orleans rain is more like yours in Singapore. Uh, we, we could manage uh, Copenhagen or, or Amsterdam, so we, but this is very difficult to manage. Uh, the subsidence problem you saw in the landscape, that's what it looks like in real terms. It, it tears up your own infrastructure. And then this strange relation, because there's water on the other side of that wall, and why would you wall it out? Because what? So then you have these opportunities, safety, this is a park where it's pumped in. And then you have this image of Rotterdam, and I dared to do that in Amsterdam to say you guys are also part of the collective villages. And then uh, quality of life. You know, this is why you are doing this. I mean, this is where people want to walk in the afternoon. The methodology, as you all know, is working from the ground up. You know, ground up in America means you talk to the people. You go sit with them and drink coffee and find out what they need. Well. Ground up doesn't really mean that, and the earth will take us back, or the water will take the sacrament. So in New Orleans, we have this, you know, blue is where it's wetter, and a 10-year flood. That's how much is out there, and we estimate about $8 billion worth of damages in our work coming in the next 50 years from that. By using these other things, we still have some residual blue, but not much, and I'll show you a couple of the ways we can reduce that flooding. These are all uh, fairly uh, sophisticated models. Uh, but there's also this damage due to subsidence. So we have two billion that we're gonna tear our own self up because we don't manage the groundwater. Because we don't pay attention to the underlying geological strata. The lithography of your place is all different and if you pay attention to that, then you can take care of it, it takes care of you. Uh, you have to understand in that case, I know this is gonna be quick and it's gonna get quicker even, I'm gonna flash, but the soils underneath, depending here, and that's all deposited by the Mississippi River, there's different patterns that go through there. So it's not all the same. There are also different landscape typologies with which you work within that area. So working from that and then renovating or working to change the drainage system to work for you instead of against nature, we then get to be making these new systems. So we have a stormwater system where it's an outflow in heavy rain. We do have to pump because we're below sea level about half. 
But we also have a dry system because, as you know, we have drought. So where do we get the water that we need in the drought times to keep from subsiding? Well, when water's all around you, it's actually quite doable, and you can choose. Do you want brackish or fresh, and how do you want to balance that? It's a wonderful opportunity here to create a water city. And then when you put all that together, you get this living network. You get this thing where it parks and all these components of the system really start to add up and people can enjoy. But there are costs, as the stock exchange here teaches, and they come before you get the benefit of it. That's the quote on your stock exchange. We estimated those costs, and those are pretty conservative estimates. We get $22 billion worth of benefits for about $6 billion worth of cost in this system. That would be a good return on investment. And that's without including him or them or all those other forms of ecological life that we do not value. In America, we're struggling to value ecological services. And yet we know this is what takes care of us. So in this water plan, and this is really just an advert for you guys to look online if you want to look at this Living With Water site, we have a vision document, we have system design, implementation, urban design documents. We have other project documents. This is a lot of stuff, but we had a lot of people working with us. The orange are our Dutch colleagues, the blue are Americans generally. So we had a big team. This is several years' work, two years in this water plan and about three getting ready for that. What's happened now is New Orleans is an island. New Orleans is, uh, is walled. Thomas Jefferson in 1802, 1803 was obsessed with getting the city of New Orleans because he had to have this place to trade on the Mississippi River. Okay? Well, he saw it as an island, and in fact, we've become an island, surrounded by water. So we look at this thing from a regional perspective of this. It's, it's uh, you know, this really valuable piece of land way down the river. In Rotterdam, you're moving the port into the river. In Louisiana, the, river, the water's coming to us. So we become more and more at the edge of the continent here. But we look inside each of these boats, and I don't expect you to understand each, but we look at each basin as an individual opportunity, as an individual system, and then what are the possibilities within each of these four basins that we have within that whole wall city? So then you look at, and some of them, this one is very suburban and generally not quite as interesting. This one is sometimes suburban, sometimes very naturalistic and ecological and somewhat interesting. But if you look then at pieces of it, you get the chance to see how the water system would work and how the green system would work, because it's not just a blue system, it's a green system, right? And then you get these opportunities as you come through to take water and create reinvestment opportunities. So this water chain, this, fought, this actually, this one runs from the battleground where the English were driven from America, because they tried to take us back, you know, in 1812, the War of 1812, they burned the capital. 1815 was the end of all that in New Orleans. The battleground's right next to this, and then here's downriver from that. And then when you come to the bottom of that bowl or bottom of that basin, it's more natural and ecological. So if you move over, then the Lower Ninth Ward, many of you probably had, have heard of the Lower Ninth Ward now. No one ever had before unless they knew Fats Domino. Um, well, the boundary there is pretty vague because there's not that many people in there. So this is a question of taking the wetland that's on one side and being renourished by uh, a sanitation system replenishment and then taking the wetland inside and trying to blur that boundary between the, the city and, and, and nature. You know, one of Amsterdam's advantages was it was never so walled off, I believe, as maybe Copenhagen was from its countryside. It always connected to nature. So then you look at the port that can be reinvested in an inner harbor. This is protected now. It wasn't so well protected before. So how would that be revitalized? We looked at that. We also looked at another point of arrival, which is the airport. If any of you come to New Orleans, you know, we have a tawdry little airport. But it's sitting there on the edge of the wetlands. If you fly in, it's all wet. You come to New Orleans, it's no more water. We exclude water from, from sight. But you're landing on the spit of land and then there's these opportunities that we've identified, this is a critical one, with empty land, because this is not working to take out properties as much as it is to take advantage of vacancy to try to redevelop land with a different model, much more like a Dutch model, where you get a higher level of, of, of uh, buildings inside that uh, wet area. And this is a subsidence control measure. There's also, you know, in a city like this, very much difference, and you need some 
different identity. This parish, Jefferson Parish, was all built from the 50s forward. It's really not very attractive. So how do they create a new identity? That last was an image. But they also have these canals that are pretty hideous. We did a groundwater experiment. They raised the level and just did exactly what you would expect. It went back, re-nourished the groundwater, raised it up. This was just done with the, with the parish trying to work on that. And then you see, well, this is what it could look like. We draw it, and I think they're going to invest in this one. But there are all these other ones. Like I say, this, there's a plethora of possibility here, an abundance of opportunity with these kind of things that fairly much, if you've ever seen the Wester single, you could imagine to be like this. So this is a chance to re-identify the, the place through the water system. The highway systems are all opportunities for storage because we have huge needs for water storage and a lot of it's paved. So how do we get the water in the ground? Well, one thing we try to do also is slow it down. So this is a slope. The river's here, and it slopes down from the river. So you try to intercept that water coming down. A lot of this is, as anybody working in urban conditions knows, you've got to do it in the street. You've got to store water coming down the slope in the street. We make these minor modifications. You can barely tell that's changed, I expect. But that tree is now pushing out into the street. Well, you might as well give it the space it wants anyway and feed it. Um, and then there are these places in between. This is between two, two parishes. It's a no man's land. If we redevelop this as this shows, we pick up, we double the safety capacity of this area. This is fallow land right now. And if we can redevelop it to be uh, this kind of space, you, you, which way does it have to go? You not only get an, an urban park for the neighborhood, but you get the safety that you have to have for reinvestment anywhere. So we looked everywhere at these opportunities through the city. Not every condition because of the soils, as I explained, is the same. So this is a different street typology, much more like some of the things you saw, green street typology that connects in uh, through, we looked at, and creates these we call floating streets because the soil is so bad they need to float. And so the water doesn't get pumped away, but in fact it's kept there. <sighs> Building streets won't make a city. How do you then aggregate that to get some identity for an, a district or a neighborhood that adds up to more? Because you have to have more, right? You have to have some kind of overall con consciousness of what you're making out of that. We also, though, in New Orleans, because of the flood, especially have these areas of vacancy. And so how do you soak up that excess real estate to stabilize the market and take these empty properties and turn them into some blue-green network which in this case we demonstrated could take half the stormwater out before it ever got into the system and create a network of urban parks. This is also funded and, and happening. Um, but as my uh, junior salesman, you know, we got all these, wa all these miles of waterfront property that's now protected. So how do you redevelop that? Louisiana is fairly close to Florida. People drive to Florida to be on the water. They don't have to drive that far. They can be on the water here. If you can figure a way to get those walls down, remember the girls looking over those walls. Well, the math shows that one of them, in fact, you could, the green is the green, and the green, you see the one on the right, that's too high, you have to do other things. But if you can get those down, and you can see here just experientially that, in fact, with that going through and not closing, I could take that down. So this is opportunity galore, but obstacle aplenty. And then the opportunity is also to take in the empty properties alongside, expand the zone to give people a place to live along that, as part of that 26 miles and let them in there. You know, people want to be there. This is like this guy thinks he's a pirate or something. You know, he's on the water. He's not supposed to be. Don't tell anybody. No, you should be there. It's a good thing to do. The oldest canal in the city is that one, that, that blue thing that comes through. The bayou is there. The French Quarter, you see, a labeled, but this was the first canal built in 1794. It was taken out over time. You see what it looked like. Uh, it was taken out over time and uh, replaced with the railroad. Now the city owns the land again, and what we've done is analyze what we can get out of this. And you see, you take five-sevenths of the flood out if you'll just use it. So passive stormwater management, you basically take out the flooding because this, this was built up. And then when you do, you also get this linear park. The High Line in New York, if you know that, wants this to be a model like them, but the real estate values in New York are a lot higher. And in New Orleans, we try to take care of the people who live there, so you wouldn't want that level of displacement. 
So it's always complicated within a community, but the opportunities you can't turn away from because you have these opportunities to re reinvigorate the real estate market right here at the French Quarter. And this is what we have to do in New Orleans. We don't have enough people to support the flood protection system. So this is not a, a neutral matter to us. We have, you know, we need another 150,000 people in that city in the next 20 years. So how do you do that? You have to make it more attractive. Well, and you also have to create a system that can adapt to climate change because climate change is real. And this is, this water system that we can create here can circulate and put water everywhere you want it very economically if we develop it. So that's using the bio, using that canal and circulating it through the other canals, unleashing that force of water. We have wetlands right there that just need water in them to become urban parks. So we've done this giant vision of the whole place, you know, and we need reinforcement now because it goes back to being that question of the spirit. How strong is the spirit? How good the will? If you come to New Orleans, you'll understand there's a feeling there unlike most of America, unlike many places in the world, that's a little different. Well, this is a congregation of nuns, sisters. This is back to the Catholic Church, I guess, and almost at the end. And they had this 25-acre uh, parcel, and after the storm, they started to rebuild, and they were flooded. They started to rebuild, and lightning struck them. So they said, no, I don't think we should rebuild there. They waited until something came that made sense, people wanted to buy their property. And what they've done is dedicate this property to this project, which is a, you know, a, either a burden or a reinforcement, depending on how I feel at the moment. But what you can do with the 25 acres is offset a lot, you can affect a lot of the rest of the watershed because you know, this is all cumulative in effect. And what you can also do when you build this sort of water train where you lift the water and let it fall through is let people experience the water as you were saying, if you don't touch it, you don't know it. You know, you have to be able to build this. And then you get this condition. This is likely a partnership with a, 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 a local uh, Catholic university to build ball fields, environmental education, and put this water train in and build this urban garden, this water garden in this part of the city that needs the revitalization. This is also, if you remember, the canal that we couldn't take the wall down on. This is what you need to be able to take those walls down. You have to do these things additionally in this zone. Okay, so it's not new, right? It's old. How do you deal with water? A cascade's not a new thing. This is a Lijiang in Yunnan province. They know they have to treasure water. China has to treasure water almost beyond anyone. So to do that, they gotta learn, right? The kids have got to become committed to this. They've got to learn how to work with this and the beauty of it, the interest of it. They got to stay modern, you know, Amsterdam again. It always is modern, whether it was the medieval or whatever, they were all, what's next? Let's move into what's next. The past and future in my premise are fairly much the same and they're all now. So how do we engage that, you know? Do we, is it nice and pleasant and we can relax? You know, in the Lely Grot, sun's there that day, so people can relax and enjoy. Ah, but lest I leave you in comfort, seas are rising. And, you know, that, that's about 18 inches different since it was built in, 1930, in the 1930s, the lake in New Orleans. So we have to have strategies to work together. Cannot do it one by one, won't finish it. That quote is... Uh, you know, a reminder. I think that, you know, um, really, it's a matter of persistence in a world of flux. Everything's changing, and we just have to persist. And if we do that, maybe we uh, enjoy our lives and stay with it. So check that website. There's lots more on it. Thanks. Thank